morning and welcome to Lakeview Fellowship. We want to take a few minutes to share a couple of things happening here for you and your family. If you are new with us today, we want you to know that we are so glad to have you here. One of the best ways you can get connected with us is to fill out the Connect card. Fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing, and then after the service, take that card to the Welcome Center. Later this week, we'll send you a gift and keep you and your family in prayer. We love seeing our Lakeview families on Sundays, but did you know we have so many different ways to connect with each other throughout the week? Launch groups are a great way to meet someone new and build lasting friendships. Launch groups are seasonal, so make sure when you see the group signups that you join the best fit group for you. There's so much happening here on Wednesdays. Awanas for children kindergarten through fifth grade, Lakeview Youth for ages 12 to 18, and Compass, a through the word Bible study. You can find more information on all of our groups in the Welcome Center. Here at Lakeview, we call everyone who serves with us a crew member. We believe you are more than just a volunteer. If you're looking for the best fit crew for you to join, check out our crew card. Fill in the information and rank your top three areas of interest. Then bring this card to the Welcome Center or drop it in the offering box, then a crew leader will reach out to you. Thanks so much for being with us today in person. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online. Visit our website, lakeviewfellowship.com, or Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Lakeview Fellowship. Here at Lakeview, we are passionate about pursuing Christ, loving people, and making disciples. And we are so excited about what God is doing through each and every one of you. As we get ready to worship, we believe God has something unique to say to you. And our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. What's going on, Lakeview? How's everybody feeling today? Come on, let's make some noise all over this place for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Is he worthy this morning? I said, is he worthy this morning? Yeah. That's right, that's right. Listen, church, I just want to let you know that this week has been crazy for me. I don't know, can you raise your hand if this week was crazy for y'all? Yeah, it was pretty wild. We had an amazing night on Friday. We had a worship night. If you were here, make some noise. And the way we started off the worship night, we're going to start off just like this, is we're going to come and we're going to bring all the things to the feet of Jesus tonight. We're going to bring all of our worries, our struggles, our battles. We're going to leave it right here because do you know that our God is the victor over every trial, over every battle? Do you believe that this morning? All right, turn to your neighbor, tell him, do you believe God is going to win over your trial? God wins. Go ahead, tell everybody that God wins.
take the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good So you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good So you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Good morning, Lakeview. Please take out your Bible and remain standing for the reading of today's scripture, Matthew 7, 1 through 12. My name is Tori Carroll, and I serve an external focus in the children's ministry. Matthew 7, 1 through 12. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take, out the lo- or take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will you will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law 
and the prophets. May God bless the reading of this word. Amen. And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. <laughs> it's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. I, that sounds really hard. Thanks. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! <laughs> Try to see things my way Do I have to keep on talking till I can go? Talk to me. Oh, it was my fault. Good morning, Lakeview. That's actually a perfect intro that I made that mistake. Um, we were, uh, Sam and I were chatting the other day about prepping for this sermon. <clears throat> and uh, he's like, you know what you should open with? I'm like, I don't know that video. And he's like, you got to watch it. And I just started laughing. I'm like, okay, let's go with it. And the interesting thing is that video, um, what you see is cause and effect. Can you see that in play there? Right? There's a cause and there's an effect. Because there's a nail in her forehead, right? She's got a splitting headache. She can't focus. She's snagging her sweaters. She can't sleep. And she frankly can't even hear clearly to the people around her, those that love her and care for her, right? Cause and effect. And what we're going to go through this morning is taking a look at... Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, but specifically what we need to understand about the Sermon on the Mount is this is Jesus basically arriving on the scene, okay, into, you know, ancient Israel, the second temple period, and he is going basically from village to village, to synagogue to synagogue, and he is recalibrating the people's understanding of the law. You see, after King David, the country of Israel, the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, fell into chaos, okay? And specifically, the way they fell into chaos is the northern kingdom basically appointed their own kings, went into apostate worship, um, ignored the Mosaic law, and then the southern kingdom basically shortly thereafter did almost the exact same thing. They held on like a little bit longer, okay? And what ends up happening is God judges his covenant people, Israel, for their disobedience, for their wickedness, for not valuing the law the way it was supposed to be valued. Okay? And the law was always intended to show people how to live in a right relationship with God and with one another and simultaneously show the people their need for God because they actually couldn't live up to that standard. Thus, the sacrificial system and the atonement and the, the, the prophesied coming Messiah. Okay? But 
now that the, the people get exiled, they're gone, living in Babylon, they get released. They come back home to Jerusalem, okay? The city's in shambles. You've heard Nehemiah. They start rebuilding the wall. They start basically figuring out how are we going to put our lives and our civilization back together? And what they concluded was, hey, us getting our heinies whooped, brought into exile, our, our women and children abused, our men killed, like, we don't want to do that again. Is that fair? Like, hey, that's, this, is like a, this is a raw thing that happened to us. Like, we don't want to live this way. So what ends up happening is they determine correctly, hey, the reason we went through all that is because we were disobedient. Because we neglected, we, we, we didn't heed, we didn't obey the law that God had given to us. And so what we see happen over the next 400 years, basically coming up to the time when Jesus arrives on the scene, is we get like this opposite reaction from the way they were before. The religious leaders are like, no way we're ever letting that happen again. We are going to follow the law. We are going to follow the letter of the law. We are not going to do that again. Does that make sense? And what ends up happening is, you ever heard the, the saying like for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Prior to this time period, it says in Judges, every person did what was right in their own eye, right? Everyone was making up their own standard, their own law, just disregarding. And there was a couple periods of reform throughout their history, but for the most part, God gave them the law and they're like, thanks for rescuing us from Egypt, but we're, we're going to take it from here, was essentially how things went, okay? After the exile, they're going... God, what, whatever you say, and then by the way, like, God, let us help you. Let us put a few more rules on the rules that you gave us, right? So that we and the people don't fall into this. And this is the context for which Jesus comes in to Israel and is now basically trying to recalibrate again because they'd swung too far. And he's trying to bring the people back to a right understanding of how does the law fit? How do you apply the law? And we see this, right, in the, in the different teachings in the Sermon on the Mount so far. The Beatitudes, right? John went through that week one. Uh, look at being salt and light, right? Like, hey, you're actually supposed to witness. You're supposed to live this out, not just be religious. Um, Christ says, hey, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So it's not that the law is obsolete. It's fulfilled through me. And then we see this when he basically then goes after the religious leaders of the day. He's like, hey, if you want to give, if you want to fast, if you want to pray, don't do it for show like these people are doing. And certainly don't think that that's what puts you in a right relationship with God. Do it from a, the right heart perspective, which means if you're giving, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. If you're fasting, don't make a big fuss about it. If you're praying, go in your prayer closet. Right? Like, because everything had become such a show to everyone to prove, I'm not the one that's going to get us hosed again. <laughs> right? Like, it's not my fault if we fall under judgment again. Like, I'm doing my part. Is this making sense? So, then we get to Jesus teaches us how to pray. And it's a completely different type of prayer than they've been praying before. See, the 400 years leading up to this, prior to that, prior to the exile, everyone just kind of prayed what was in their heart. There was freedom there. But after this, they put everyone on a strict prayer schedule. Sunrise, prayer. Mid-morning coffee, prayer. Middle of the day, prayer. Afternoon, prayer. Evening sunset, prayer. Everyone stops what they're doing. We all pray. We read the scriptures. And that way, okay, we're, we're, we're doing that. Is this making sense? So everything became very regimented and every, very legalistic. And Jesus is saying, hey, I see you. I see you're trying to fulfill the law. But you're going about it all wrong. That's not how you're going to be in a right relationship with me. This is meant to be a map. This is meant to be a signpost. It's not meant to be the end goal of justification. So let's open in a moment of prayer here. And then we'll dive in the text, okay? Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here with my brothers and sisters this morning. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing here. 
Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just join us in this moment. You promise that whenever two are gathered in your name, you are with us. So we just invite you, Lord. Lord, there's a lot of distractions. School starts soon. Got work. Got sports on TV. Got groceries. Lord, I pray that every person, that you're, you would just calm their minds and their hearts this morning to be able to just listen, to be able to receive from you. And Lord, we pray specifically that every person would be intellectually challenged, that their mind would be worked this morning, that they would learn, that they would grow, that they would know new information that they did not know. But Lord, we do not want it to stop there. Lord, we pray for heart transformation. We pray that you would turn hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. Circumcise our hearts, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we started with kind of these two themes, cause and effect. And we started with this saying, hey, it's not about the law. Well, is it or isn't about the law? The answer is, well, yeah, kind of. It's about the law, but like we talked about, the law is a way that God gave the people to have order. Order in their relationship with him and order in their relationship with each other. Okay? Um, and there's this concept. It's actually a theological working all throughout scripture. It's called retribution theology. Real quick, nerd check. I'll put my hand up. Anyone ever heard that term? John, myself, Tamara, anyone else? Okay, we got like five people. Okay, so I'm not wasting my time here using this to, to spend a moment on this. So retribution theology is essentially the idea of the following. Okay, you get what you deserve. You reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. We already touched on this one. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction, right? Um, how about this one? The punishment should fit the crime. How about the reward should be proportional to basically the effort or the accomplishment? Is that fair? And see, we, we worship a God of order. And this is very, very important because there's people out there that think everything just happened. No, no, no. The whole world, the universe is ordered. And one of the things that God ordered was this idea of basically cause and effect. Well, one of the areas where this plays out is when Israel was established as a nation, there was no law enforcement. There were no police. There was no national guard. So what happens when your brother or sister does something to you? Let's say they steal your cattle. They steal your flock. What do you do? Do you call 911? Hey, sorry, my sheep and goats are missing. There is no 911. How do you handle that? Well, if we go back to the Old Testament, to the giving of the law, God gave them in Leviticus how to handle such things. And one thing I want to make very, very clear is that what we're talking about here is issues of basically criminality, right? And this law was given in such a way so that if, if I know that there's going to be an opposite and equal reaction for the crime I commit against you, I'll probably think twice before I do it, right? Is that fair? So God, in his mercy, designs a system to where he basically says, okay, if someone crosses the line, brings not just an offense, but like an actual crime, you now have the right as the citizenry, right, as the people to enact justice on that person. And that's where we get the idea of retribution theology. Okay, read with me. I'm going to actually don't read it. Uh, can you put the, up on the slide, please? The first slide. Here's a list of, go back one, please. Uh, here's a list. Take a picture, write these down, whatever you need to do. Go look these verses up. We're not going to read them all. It would take too long. I'm already long-winded. Okay, so, but go look these up because these are helpful in this context. But this is what it says in Leviticus chapter 24. It says, whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make good for it. Life for life. 
How about this? Verse 19, anyone who injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. Retribution theology. If then, cause, effect, sowing and reaping. Punishment fits the crime. How about Exodus chapter 21? It says, whoever strikes a man so that he dies, that person shall be put to death. If someone willfully attacks another human being, you should take him from my altar that he may die. Whoever strikes his father or mother or dishonors them or curses them shall be put to death. That's in Exodus chapter 21. Verse 23, but if there is harm, you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So what God is setting the president for, the presidents, right, is that it is okay as a deterrent and also as an act of God's justice to bring something full circle to try to basically restore it or make it right, right? So in the situation where someone stole my flock, I have the right then to go take my flock back or demand of them that I, I get my flock replaced. That's justice. Does that make sense? But here's the problem. The wickedness of the human heart, we try to find ways around justice, or when I'm offended, I want to take it a step further. You knocked my tooth out, I want to cut your head off. Right? You took five bucks from me, I'm going to like light your car on fire. Like, the, the heart gets, gets wound up, and we want to enact unequal justice. And that is not what God ever permitted. Okay? But he wanted to make sure there was equal justice for those offenses that were done. Is this making sense? We learning something? Hopefully? Good. How about in Deuteronomy chapter 19? What if there's a false witness? Someone steps on the scene. They get together with their buddy and they're like, hey, let's defraud the system. Let's defraud the person. Well, here's what it says. It says if there's a malicious witness that arises and wrongly accuses someone of a wrongdoing, that person is now liable for basically that which they were trying to thrust on someone else. Ryan's loose paraphrase. Is that fair? If someone's trying to manipulate to get you in trouble, that there would be a reaction against them? It's the way God set it up. God's a God of order. Okay? And there's multiple other verses on this. Job 4, 8 says, Those who plow iniquity and sow trouble should reap the same. Proverbs 1, 7, those who, 1, 7, those who fear the Lord, they will grow in knowledge and wisdom. And those who don't, like they don't fear God, they're going to grow in folly. They're going to lack understanding. Okay? Malachi 3.10, the famous verse on giving and tithing. If you will bring to my storehouse... See if I will not, or sorry, if you will bring, right? If you will bring your tithes and offerings, see if I won't give back to you in abundance. See if I won't equally pay you back. In fact, I'm God, I will do even better by you. Malachi 3.10. And then we see in Galatians, Paul, this is the first letter written by Paul to a New Testament church, the church in Galatia, comprised of Jews mostly, and he says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one sows to his flesh will reap from the flesh real corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap the Spirit and eternal life. Okay, so Ryan, why did you go all the way over here for retribution theology in this little lesson on this if we're in the Summer on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount series? Anyone wondering that? Okay, hopefully I can connect it together very, very well. Okay is if we don't understand the mindset of a Jewish person that is living under like this pharisaical, pharisaical, for lack of a better word, tyrancy or oppression, right? The religious leaders have everyone so wound up that everyone is pursuing perfection and everyone is pointing the finger at everyone. Everyone's trying to get right with God by what they do rather than what God has done in who he is. 
they've misdiagnosed the problem and therefore they're misapplying the solution. You with me? Is this making sense? So if we get to then um, verse 1 of chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. Jesus is now speaking to the people and this is what he says. He says, judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Okay, so what we see happening here is this principle of retribution, this theology of retribution, this, this cause and effect system, people were now basically trying to, as we talked about, be good, right? And they're, they're over-applying it is basically what's going on, right? Let me do you a favor and point out all of your wrongs <laughs> so that you can be right with God. I'm, I'm doing a nice, a nice thing for you, right? Let me do you a favor and point out all your wrongs. But what we're talking about here is not Christian discipline. We are not talking about people that are living in blatant sin. Those people, we, I need to be called out if I'm in blatant sin. What Jesus is mostly attending to is issues of the heart. Differences of opinion. Hey, we, we have a different perspective about how to go about solving the same problem. We have stylistic preferences, right? But I am now, it's not that you're living in sin. It's that I am judging you for not doing it the way that I think is best. And the people that were the biggest propagators of this were the religious leaders. In fact, they had invented like 600 and something extra rules to go on top of the law. And so can you imagine if you've got the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, plus Leviticus, and then you have all these other things that you're always trying to follow. Like what kind of culture that would be? Think about our culture. Like what is the number one value that has arisen over like the last 15 or 20 years? Don't judge me. Don't tell me what to do. Like this culture is the exact opposite. Let me tell you what to do. Let me tell you how to live rightly. And you got to remember, a lot of it was rooted in a misunderstanding of this is the right way to have a right relationship with God. But a lot of it was also rooted in, hey, we don't want to go back there again. We do not want to be under the thumb of a foreign power in exile with our religious folks getting thrown in lion's den and fiery furnaces and that sort of thing. Right? Understandable. Okay. So then we move on to verses three through five and Jesus gives an example here. And he says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. I happen to believe that a lot of this messaging was for the benefit of the everyday people, but he, Jesus was, was, was going after the leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the elite. And so he's like, hey, let me preach to everyone, but this is really a zinger at you, right? And he's calling them hypocrites. Let's, let's pull up a couple images here real quick, and then we'll talk about it. So... These are kind of funny clip art, but look at the one on the left. Dude, I think I've got something in my eye. Hey, don't worry. I'll help you get it out. <laughs> Do you want that person's help if you got a piece of sawdust in your eye? Help if you got a piece of sawdust. How about the second one, right? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Let's ask you a question here. If I have a piece of sawdust in my eye, or let's say I have a splinter in my foot, who should it bother most? Me, right? If I have a splinter in my foot or a piece of sawdust in my eye, like the person that should bother most is me, right? And Jesus is using this absurd example to make the point that, hey, we got all of these people that have blind spots that are in positions of religious authority and it's like they're walking around with two by fours in their eyes trying to basically correct everyone's behavior. And he's saying, knock it off. 
This is absurd. This is ridiculous. But more importantly, he's, he's, he's speaking to the condition of the heart. He's using a physical imagery that reflects a spiritual condition. And the spiritual condition is that of people's hearts that they think, because I'm doing A, B, and C, from the way I'm measuring it better than you are, I'm in a better right standing relationship with God than you are. Do we see this happen at all in our culture? It's interesting, the church, the number one criticism from outsiders is, y'all are a bunch of hypocrites. Right? Sometimes valid, sometimes not. Here's the deal, guys. Sometimes the most devout Christ followers, the most devout Jews, in all of their sincerity and all of their effort are actually the most judgmental. Like, it's like we become self-righteous, we become pious. And so Jesus is really going after the religious leaders, but it's a message for everyone is, hey, knock it off. But more importantly, if you really understood your condition before a holy God, if you really understood the law, you wouldn't be acting like this. Said another way, if your eyes were on Jesus, if your eyes were on God Almighty, and not on your neighbor, you'd be worrying about the plank in your own eye. So get your focus right, is what Jesus is saying to the religious leaders and the people. So then Jesus goes into verse six here, and there's just like this little funny verse. And this is what he says. He says, do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Anyone ever heard these things? Like, don't cast your pearls before swine. So, like, I'm from Southern California originally. I never heard that growing up. After I moved to Texas, like, 15 years ago, I heard that, like, 10 times in, like, the first six months. I'm like, I got to figure out what this means. I have no idea what these people are saying. It was like, bless your heart. I thought people were being nice to me when they said that. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, the people are so nice here. Right? <laughs> So, but here's the idea. Jesus is actually using metaphorical language and he's using a word picture to try to connect this last concept in a way that they would understand it. Okay, in this culture, there are two animals that are basically considered like the lowest of the low. In Texas, this might be like rats and snakes. Okay? Like, I don't know anyone that likes to have rats and snakes everywhere. Well, in, in their culture... Dogs were considered rabid and swine was considered unclean. Okay? What Jesus is, let, let me give you, what Jesus is saying here is, hey, actually, let me give an example first. Who here has dogs? Raise your hand. Anyone have pigs? <laughs> no, okay. But everyone has dogs, right? So if you give your dog dog food, do they eat it? Yes. Yes. Do they seem to have some preferences of stuff maybe they like a little bit more? Absolutely. Do, if you give your dog like a Twinkie or like a Hostess cupcake, do they eat it? What about if you give your dog filet mignon fresh off the grill? Do they eat it? Right? What if there's a pile of throw up or some doo-doo outside? Do they eat it? <laughs> right? So Jesus is making this point that dogs can't recognize what's good. Dogs can't recognize what's holy. And there are some of you that are listening to the words of Jesus right now as he's preaching and you can't hear it. You can't discern it. You can't make it out. You don't know what he's saying. You can't comprehend it because you're walking around with a hard heart or you have a misunderstanding of the law and what the relationship with God is supposed to look like. Same analogy with a, with a pig. Does a pig care if you throw, right, sand or rocks or pearls in their bed? Like, do they find any extra value out of the pearls being there? No, they're unable to recognize and discern the value that's inherent there. Same thing, Jesus, in, in basically just doubling up, it's a teaching rhetorical style. 
in ancient Israel. It's like, hey, say something, make the point, then say it again slightly different to hammer home the point. And what he's saying is, you've all heard the, hear, the saying, right? Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Right? This is repeated throughout the Gospels. This is the same concept. So here's the problem. Before we go any further. How many of you, when we're going through, don't raise your hand, by the way, okay? We, you can if you want. That would be really nice. But how many of you, when we were going through the section on judgment, had someone else going through your mind? You're like, I know someone who needs to hear this. That person is so judgmental. They really need to hear this message. Maybe I'll forward it to them later. No, Jesus is saying, clean out your ears. This message is for you. Every single one of us. It's for me. It's not for your neighbor, although it might be beneficial to your neighbor. It's for everyone who's listening to the words of Jesus and reading the words of Jesus. Don't be the dog that can't discern what's holy. That can't discern the filet mignon from the throw up. Jesus has given you spiritual truth here. Moving on. Verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the third time in only three chapters that Jesus is addressing prayer. This must be an important part of the spiritual life. Right? The first time, he was teaching them, don't pray like the Pharisees. Don't make a show. The second time, he gives us the, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but, or the model prayer, or the disciples' prayer. There's different things people call it. Basically teaching us how to pray. Okay, and I already touched on this before, but what prayer had turned into for these people was a means of basically reciting things to God in some sort of like liturgical or repeated or systematic fashion over and over that over time, it almost loses its meaning. Right? If I say the same thing every single day for 20 years, at the same time every single day, I, start, I, I run the risk of believing that it's about me saying the prayer rather than the words in the prayer. And Jesus is calling the people back to a personal prayer. He's not saying you can't pray corporately. He's saying, no, you've got a heavenly father who's good. He hears you. He's listening. He's for you. He's not just waiting up there looking for the next mistake to crush you, which is what the message going out from the religious leaders is. He loves you. But on top of that, he's also trying to impart in them the heart of prayer. Okay? And in the heart of prayer, what, what God is looking for is someone who is asking, who is seeking, who is knocking, who is saying, Lord, I'm like the dog. I can't tell the difference between what's good and evil. Lord, I am like the swine that can't discern that which is precious and which isn't. Would you please, I'm begging you, God Almighty, open my eyes, open my heart. Bring me to a place that I can't bring myself because in my own strength and in my own flesh, I'm naturally religious. I'm not relational with you. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and open my spiritual eyes. That is the heart that Jesus is trying to get the people to pray from. You know, I've often wondered, how do I pray? Like, like God, teach me to pray. Have any of you ever had that feeling like, hey, like I'm not a good prayer? 
Like, I wish I could pray better. I wish I could be more faithful. I wish I like knew the right words to say. I wish like I could pour out my heart more authentically, all those sort of things. Um, if, you, if you have, you're not alone. I've had that many, many times. Um, I think sadly, and this is not an indictment on our culture. All of us live in this culture. It, it is what it is. But it's very, very helpful to go back throughout history and see how Christians throughout history viewed themselves, how they viewed their relationship with God. Anyone know who Martin Luther is? One of the great reformers. We got Martin Luther, we got John Calvin, and we basically got all of these uh, people in the 15, 14, 15, 16, 1700s that are basically looking at what the church had become. And it become a lot like it, the, 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 the Jewish temple cultic system had become in Jesus' day. It was just full of politics. It was full of power. It was full of money. It was full of basically getting people to do things separate from what the word actually said. Right? And these reformers actually like, hey, I'm going to stop listening to the religious leaders and I'm going to start reading the Bible. And as they started reading the Bible, it just totally changed their perspective. And where I'm going with this is sometimes in order to learn how to pray, we probably need to not look to our neighbor left or right. We need to go back to the word and say, God, I want to know, teach me to pray. Teach me how to pray. Teach me for what to pray. But sometimes it's helpful to go back. So I'm going to read a prayer of Martin Luther, okay? This was his perspective on himself. He says, behold, Lord, I am an empty vessel that needs to be filled. My Lord, fill it. I am weak in the faith. Strengthen me. I'm cold in love. Warm me and make me fervent that my love may go out to my neighbor. I do not have strong and firm faith. At times I doubt. And I am unable to trust you altogether. O oh Lord, help me. Strengthen my faith and trust in you. In you, I have sealed the treasure of all I have. I am poor, you are rich. And you came to be merciful to the poor. I am a sinner, you are upright. With me, there is an abundance of sin. In you is the fullness of righteousness. Therefore, I will remain in I will remain with you of whom I can receive, but to whom I have nothing to give. Beautiful prayer. That is a softened, changed, new heart. Interesting that the person who basically reformed Christianity, the way we now understand and practice, that's how he viewed himself when he was on his knees before God Almighty. This is the opposite of what the religious leaders in the day were doing. They're stepping out to the corner. It's prayer time. Everyone see me? I know the words. Here I go. And they're praying in such a way to be noticed, thinking that that earns them a right relationship with God. Jesus says, no. <laughs> go on your knees, close the door in your prayer closet and approach your heavenly father. The other thing we see about this passage right back here is it says God is good. It says he's a good father. When you go and pray to him, he's not going to give you a serpent when you ask for a fish. He's not going to give you a stone when you ask for bread. But what he does want you is to ask for the right things with the right heart, with a changed heart. But we never have a changed heart until we truly understand how far short we fall when we try to earn our way to God through keeping the law or some rules we met, we made up. So we finish with verse 12. This is what it says. It says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them for this is the law and the prophets. Everyone knows this, right? The golden rule. Who learned this like in Sunday school? The golden rule. This is like, this is like a staple of our culture. It's the ideal and it comes straight from the scriptures. Here's the hard part, right? It's the ideal. Who loves their neighbor the way they love themselves? Right? If we're honest, none of us do this well. And so as Jesus is, is getting 
to this place where he's wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount and Matthew is kind of compiling this in this order, the next thing Jesus is going to basically turn around and say is, hey, there's a broad road and there's a narrow road. And a lot of you are on the broad road. I want to call you to the narrow road. But it starts through having a proper view of God, a proper understanding of the law, and a proper view of yourself. But Jesus didn't, this is, this is one of the criticisms today, is that like, hey, the Old Testament's kind of irrelevant. No, it wasn't to Jesus. When Jesus gives this right here, he, this is what he says. He says, the law and the prophets, this is what they're all about. That whatever you wish someone to do to you, you would do likewise for them. Remember we talked about judgment. That's where we started, right? Do you want someone nitpicking every little thing you do? Or do you want the grace extended to you, right? You're storing up that for yourself. There's this cause and effect. There's this, it's your choice. But here's the deal. None of us can do this on our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the forgiveness of Christ. We need God's retributive justice redirected from what we have earned onto Christ. Because if I stand before God, think about this for a second. If I stand before God Almighty and, I, and I, I've stolen, I've lied, I've manipulated justice, I don't get to say to God, but I also went to a, like a food pantry one time. Like one has nothing to do with the other. There's still an opposite and equal reaction. There's still justice required for the things that, that I have done. Does that make sense? And we, we've, we've created this thing in our, in our culture where it's like a debit and credit system. One has nothing to do with the other. Nothing. Listen to what it says in Leviticus 19. If, it, if we could lower the lights here, could we lower the lights? And it, what I'd like to do right now is everyone just close your eyes, put your Bible down, put your phone down. Try not to be distracted. We're going to be done in a few minutes here. Okay? And just listen to the law that was given by Moses to the people. And this is where Jesus is quoting from. This is what he says. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Rather, shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip the vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner declares the Lord. I am the Lord. Next, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly, frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, says the Lord. We must all accept that we deserve to be treated by God according to the way that we have fallen short and we have treated other people. In a punitive justice system, we are all guilty and punishable by what we just listened to. 
God should withhold with us because we withhold from others, specifically the poor. God should treat us with deception and lie to us because that's what we've done. God should punish us for profaning his name, for taking his name lightly, for using his name in vain, for saying things on behalf that he didn't say, either in word or testimony. God should hold compassion back from us because we haven't shown it fully to those around us especially the oppressed and the disadvantaged and the disabled. God should twist justice on us since we've all twisted the facts to get what we want. God should withdraw his love from us because we have all failed to show love and hated our brother. Lastly, God should take vengeance on us for all of these things. And he should bear an eternal grudge because of the things we've done. Instead, let the lights raise up, right? Instead, through Jesus, God was selfless, sending down his own son and dying sacrificially for us while we were yet sinners. God overlooks our profanity and he sees Christ's righteousness when we ask him to. God in his mercy and compassion comes and offers us rescuing when we have deliberately walked away from him and other people. God loved me when I showed him nothing in return and did not show any of my neighbor's love. He loved me first. God poured out his retributive justice on Jesus as the sacrificial lamb instead of on me for all the justice I've, I've twisted. Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, that hell awaits those that don't get this. Again, in chapter 10, Jesus says, you know what you should be afraid of? Not, not what other people think, but the one who has the power to make the final determination of whether you are just in his eyes or not. Revelation chapter 20 talks about the lake of fire where Satan, the devil, is going to be thrown. And here's the deal. Every one of us agrees that he deserves it. Satan deserves an eternal lake of fire, right? We all agree with that. But anyone who doesn't accept Christ's covering we deserve the same. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. This is a heavy word, God. You came on a scene in a culture that, that thought they were doing it so right and their hearts had grown so far from you. When they looked at the mirror, they were measuring things all wrong, God. When we look at you and we look at the law, we see how far we, sh how far we fall short. Whatever is it. <laughs> how short we fall. So God, I just pray for every person in here that already knows you, that's walking with you. Lord, I just pray that over the next 20, 30 seconds here, you would just bring them back to the joy of their salvation. That they would just remember the moment they felt your mercy and your forgiveness. The moment they recognized they no longer had to earn it but that you had redirected your wrath for their sin onto Christ and you set them free by his blood. Let them just give you praises under their lips in this moment.
And Lord, we also just come before you. This passage started talking about judge not lest ye be judged and the measure. Lord, I don't think there's a certain person, any, any person here that wants a whole bunch of judgment heaped up for themselves from our neighbor or from you. So Lord, we just, we just ask for forgiveness of that. Lord, soften our hearts towards you and towards our neighbors. Lord, if we've got something between us and a loved one or a friend or a coworker, Lord, let it just melt away. Transform our hearts, soften our hearts. Let us not be concerned with the dust in their eye, but more concerned with the, with the logs that you're still removing gracefully and gently from us. And Lord, lastly, we just pray for anyone here who doesn't know you. Right, I pray that they would just know that they could have peace, that they could have new life, and that they can't earn their way to you. The, the scorecard will never measure up according to your system. I pray that if you're just stern in their hearts, Lord, after this service, they would just find a leader, a staff member, a deacon, an elder, somebody. Just say, I don't have it all figured out, but, but I want this Jesus. I want this love. I'm tired of trying to make it in my own strength. And I see I don't measure up. And we could walk alongside them and just disciple them in you. Just soften their hearts in this moment and give them the courage to respond. And we thank you for your word and for this time together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Uh, this morning, we're going to wrap up pretty quick, but we, we have a special thing to take care of before we do that. Um, just in conclusion of Ryan's message, Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and you think Romans 3.24 is, and God smited us and killed us. Uh, but, but it goes on in Romans 3.26 to say that God was both the just, the one who punishes sin, and the justifier, the one who died for the punishment of sin. That, Amen. that verse is so profound. That God loves you so much that he would judge you rightly. He's a good and righteous judge. But in his judgment of you, he says, I know you're guilty, but I will also take the death you deserve. And he sends his son to die for us. And what a profound love that God has lavished on us. So thank you, Ryan, for that message. Well, if y'all don't know, this is Ryan Coiner. Probably most of you know him, but maybe you don't. Uh, Ryan Coiner is an elder here at Lakeview Fellowship. He's been that for some time and faithfully served this church and, and done a great job. Can we tell Ryan thank you for all the work he's done? I'm not going to tell your story. I'll let you do it for you. But Ryan's been in Colorado for a period of time, and uh, he feels like God is calling him and his family there for this season. And so I just want to give you a few moments to let sure. the church get some context and perspective on where you're at. Yeah. Okay, is this still, it's still on? Well, good to see you this morning. Hopefully that, uh, that was challenging, encouraging. Um, love to be with you. My wife and myself and Kyla at the time, who they're both in the front row, Katie and Kyla, uh, we started coming to Lakeview 2012, so 10 years ago. So um, there's a handful of folks that have been here as long or not longer, but uh, not many. It's great to see so many new faces. Um, and I started just helping out with the finance team, then became a deacon, became part of the pastoral leadership team, uh, became an elder here at the church and uh, was really called to be an elder, I think, at a very pivotal and difficult time in this church's life. Um, our senior pastor of 33 years who had served faithfully and loved this flock well. Uh, it was just time. God, God was moving him on. And he asked, I believe, myself and Philip and a few other folks uh, not to diminish. There were so many people involved during that season. But he you know, really asked a few of us to just step in a time where it, it, we, we couldn't see the way through. I mean... But we got a big God, so it was okay. Um, and after that, uh, that was during the COVID season. Um, we were all praying faithfully, and then God uh, brought um, John through relationships. Um, 
on the horizon and we started having conversations and we basically determined that we had a church that God had provided. And when I say church, I mean building, property, facilities, no debt, just amazing graces of God, right? And, and that goes to the faithful stewardship of generations past. But we were without local, vocational, committed leadership. Um, and John was just down the road, uh, had planted a church at probably one of the most difficult times ever, right heading into COVID. And uh, they did not have a location, did not have a lot of resources. And uh, as we pray prayers that, that God hears, God, your will be done. He brought this all together. And after that season, I just to be honest, I was knackered. <laughs> I was worn out. Uh, my wife had had a lot of health challenges. Um, we had a lot of fam family dynamics we were, we were uh, dealing with and we have a place up in Colorado and we sold our house here and we just decided to spend a lot more time up there um, and just heal and rest. Kind of like a sabbatical, if you will. Um, I think I have three businesses right now that all require attention, three children, ministry, and like I was just spent. And uh, so this last year, we've spent a lot of time up there and God has just been super faithful in just healing us, restoring us, allowing us to basically finish up our studies in seminary. And uh, you know, one of the things that we, as, as we headed up there more and more last year, we were just unclear, you know, hey, is this a season? Or, you know, is this for good? And, and what do we do with Lakeview? We, this, this has been our church home for 10 years. We love the body. Um, one of our values serves sacrificially. We try to embody that. Um, and it just became more and more clear, not necessarily that God has us in Colorado the rest of our life, but, but that our assignment here as an overseer and a shepherd in this congregation was just, the, the church is now in good hands. The church is in good hands. We got John, we got Mickey, we got Sam, we got Billy, we got Philip. We got all the deacons. We got all the staff. We have so many of you that serve faithfully. And I see God's spirit moving in this church. And I really believe the Lord is asking me to basically step down for the well-being of this church. And also, sometimes you take steps of faith not knowing what's coming before God reveals the next assignment. And I feel like right now, God's given us some things that we're eyeing and some things that we're working on. We're doing some student ministry with young adults because there's a need in the town we're at. But we're really just praying and trying to discern, Lord, what's next? And um, there's a lot of churches and ministries and congregations out there that are not blessed with the abundance of resources that this church has. And I, and I really just kind of feel a conviction. I'm going to get teary-eyed. A conviction in my heart that the Lord will probably lead us to some place like that where they don't have the resources and people, training, money, whatever it is, um, and get to work to, to build the kingdom and, and love our neighbors there. So, it's very emotional. Huh? So thank you for your love. Thank you for continuing to work faithfully. Love you guys. So, church body, we bought Ryan a compass that will guide him back home to here uh, eventually, right? And we just want to say we love you and we thank you for that. All that you do for us, all that you've done for us, all that you will keep doing. It's not over. The relationship's not severed. Uh, I think of Acts chapter 13, and the church has this real sense that God is calling out Paul and Barnabas to do the work of the ministry in other places. And it says in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 2, that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And they then started going out and doing missionary work all across the world. And we have this real sense. We've been praying since, I mean, probably five, six months now uh, that God would just give us understanding and clarity and what the future holds. And while we don't have all the pieces together 
you're convinced, we're convinced that God is blessing you and sending you to Colorado to be light and darkness, salt, and, and all of that there. Uh, and so what we want to do is just like they did in Acts where they were convinced of this, the Holy Spirit was there, and they said, pray and send them. That's what we want to do for y'all, if that's okay today. Uh, and so if you're a pastoral staff here, uh, would you come on up? We want to invite you up here to pray over the Coiner family. We love them. And uh, that's how we're going to end our service today, is we just want to pray and send them on. We, we hate goodbyes, uh, but gospel goodbyes are good, because it means that God is working all around the world to do that which he has called us to do, and this is no exception. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, as we pray, that'll be the end of our service. We'll conclude. Uh, we're having baptism class right across the hall in the fellowship hall. If you've never been baptized, if you were sprinkled as a child, if you have questions about baptism, there's a free lunch. How can you beat that? Right across the way here in the fellowship hall. As soon as service is over, come to baptism class. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But let's for now pray and send Ryan off. Church, if you would join us praying. Gracious Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the work of your gospel and how it moves in and through your people. Lord, that you would use us, Lord, to reach a dying world, to just share, Lord, the message and the good news, Father, of the work that you have done. We thank you so much, Lord, for servants like the Coiner family who have served you diligently and faithfully for so many years to this fellowship known as Lakeview. Lord, their other kids were raised here, Father. Uh, many hours, Father, in planning and overseeing and giving biblical counsel, Father. Times of being challenged personally and confronting, um, Lord, conflict and giving and asking for forgiveness, Lord, and emulating, Father, all the things that you desire from your children. And now, Father, we just thank you for this new season that you have uh, opened the door for the Coiner family, Lord, in Colorado, to feed into the next generation, Father, who are without a shepherd. And we thank you that Lakeview can be a sending church, Sending, Father, um, one of our own to instill in them, Lord, the, the same um, spirit of excellence, humility, Father, dedication to your word and living a life of worship and constantly bathing everything in prayer. May you bless the work of their hands, Lord. May you open the doors of opportunity. May there be unity in the church, Father, that's over there and they're receiving. Lord, um, we're excited to see you spreading and multiplying as the church should, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord, for your anointing to be on Ryan, on Katie, on Kyla, Lord, on Preston, on Sylvie, Father, as they emulate, Lord, your grace and your mercy. Father, I, I pray right now for the divine appointments, Lord, to be set for them to minister and, Father, for them to just be diligent and obedient in service of your gospel. And we pray for that word, Lord, to be fruitful. And Lord, in that it be multiplied again until you come back, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you have done in and through this family and to be have the beneficiaries, Lord, of all their work. But Lord, ultimately, that you get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Have a wonderful week of worship.